We are black faggots with a political agenda. We your worth not me. Who do you think you're talking? A murderer. And we're gonna fight you to, to the, the death. death. Chocolate Babies, we're here with Ryan Walker Edwards on Boxing Day. Yo. Having eaten too much chocolate on yeah. the day Christmas. previous. <laughs> um, today we're talking about a film that we saw together mm-hmm. at Close Up Cinema in Shoreditch. Shout out. Shout out. Um, and it absolutely blew us both away. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's diabolically underrated and underseen. A uh, film by written and directed by Stephen Winter called Chocolate Babies um, about a, a band of HIV positive queer urban genderqueer activists of color um, uh, exposing political corruption surrounding the AIDS epidemic in 1996. Um, the film had a 1997 premiere premiere at Berlin um, played San Francisco won. Uh, an honourable mention for best film at South by Southwest uh, that year as well. Um, yeah, the 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 film even now uh, is totally progressive and uh, wild and just plays in its eighty minute runtime. I think um, like it's on fire and and just touches on so many political issues that aren't that, that are relevant but also as a movie just has this energy to it that a lot of movies most movies today don't have um ryan shade <laughs> yeah no the film was the film was great uh it's kind of a bit like you, i wouldn't really know about that film and obviously because you were talking about queer topics are sort of like you know a, a big present like you know overwhelming topic in today's like world how that film hasn't really I would probably say it, it's it does quite a lot when you watch it as as an audience member, but like in terms of like the film world, it's really sort of like brushed under the carpet. Um, so yeah, that's just something that really really interesting that I wanted to you know talk about there. Uh, all the characters in it were amazing. You know, uh, it focused on you know non-white characters, people of color, and it kind of had every sort of like facet of sort of like the queer identity within the film. And it was really interesting. I wanted to know if Stephen, well, you speaking to him, was he sort of like aware of that? Was he aware of, you know, adding different identities within it, you know, different identities with, within the film? Yeah, he was talking about um, the obviously uh, Sp- Spike Lee kind of bursting onto the scene. Yeah. Uh, with his first three films and just completely blowing up with Do the Right Thing. But he he spoke about how those films kind of showed him and his peers at the time that you didn't have to um, put a white lead or a white co-star in, in your movie. And, and he, he says um, in the interview with, uh, that I did with him, he, he says that, that it's strange to think about it now, but mm. in the 90s, you know, we, we pop culture remembers the 90s of... of as uh, a decade of absolutely groundbreaking films with yeah. in Tarantino and the indie film movement and um, Sundance and Linklater, uh, mm-hmm. Scorsese having a moment and, and just all of these films which are great but um, that it were at the expense of ostracizing a lot of other voices. Yeah. And um, he, yeah, he, he kind of, he spoke about that and he spoke about, I, I asked him why the film, why he feels that the film didn't have um, the reception that it, it deserved because he, he said to me that um, people were telling him and, and the, the, fil- the rest of the, the crew and the producers that, um, that the film was going to win something, that it was going to play Sundance and it never played Sundance, that it was going to be big, you know. Yeah. He, it premiered at the Berlin Film Festival mm-hmm. and it arrives with, um, some fanfare, but then to make the long story uh, crisp and clean, uh, the forces of racism um, emerged and people quickly started changing the narrative around the film that it was not what people wanted to see. Um, and so we would go into festivals. We went from Berlin to uh, San Francisco South by Southwest, Toronto, and they kept saying, 
ahead of time, well, you're going to win an award because this is fabulous. And then we wouldn't get the award. Mm -hmm. um, and so we can now appreciate that the forces that ran the industry were not going to allow this film to come through. It called a call spade a spade. The, the film, you know, was great. Well, you know, in, in my opinion, whatever that means, it was great. I think at that time, you know, was it, you know, a, a bit too progressive in a, in a way, you know? And I think maybe that's just something that that did play a part in, you know, it's, it's sort of like, you know, s s sort of like sweeping under the rug or, or that sort of like, not really erasure because I think it's still there now, but... I mean, it did well to play, like, you know, at all these festivals and all these places. But you would probably, it's it's quite a shame that, you know, we're, we only saw it in, like, 2019. Um, you know, seeing something which is talking about, you know, HIV, AIDS, you know, uh, marginalised people, but even the subcurrents of, like, you know, marginalised, like, queer black people is a bit, like, you know, for a, bit, a lot of audience members, like, whoa, okay. Yeah. Like, now we can talk about it from point of view. We have, you know, we've got the moonlight, you know, we've got sort of visibility for, you know, people. But I think back then, you're probably right, it was just, like, the go-to token guy was probably Spike. Yeah. And, and, and even t just talking about that we have those films now that discuss yeah. these issues, they, they even, you know... M Moonlight. I mean, Barry Jenkins is a, is, a, is a spectacular filmmaker, but there are a lot of other films that um, I yeah. feel like we're only even scratching the surface exactly. nowadays. Yeah. And, and, and Chocolate Babies, it's not just a film that deals with these issues and got overlooked. It's a film that deals with these issues and has this aesthetic and this yeah. voice and this energy to it that I saw this movie and I just remember looking at you and I was thinking, this is these are the films I want to make, like yeah. not necessarily about this or about, you know, but th with this energy and with this yeah, honesty and so true. just to add that, you know, Steve, Steven Winter was a, an, an NYU student at the time mm -hmm. and when he made this. And I mean that, that it, it shouldn't, um, it wouldn't take away from the film if he wasn't a student, but it definitely adds something to the fact that this is his first feature. This was made in a very collaborative environment with lots of, um, favors being pulled and uh, on on a very limited schedule on yeah. film, you know. So it it I I even think today the film is would be it is too um it's not risque, but it, it in its form it's yeah. risque for people to it just hits you in the face like it's I said it's kind of like a fastbinder um it's got this like. This violence to it visceral, and its images, like it's yeah, like, it's visceral, yeah. I think that's it. it's it's punk in a way, yeah. you know. And speaking of like you know work with you and collaborating, it's like you know making punk films. Um, is do people you know who go to cinema want want to see that? You know, if you're looking at sort of like you know buyers or distribution companies, is that something that they look at? They're like, oh, this is this is too punk. This isn't gonna you know fill the screens. Well, I think now it, it's strange because. When this was this film, so this film didn't really get a proper distribution. It didn't get the money. You know, Stephen said it didn't get the the distribution funds that it needed to actually finish. So it kind of, he I, I guess he had some extra things to do to it or, or finessing in, yeah. in, in the in the final stages of of um, usually a film does its festival run and then has some finishing done to it. Um, but the people that distributed this uh, are Frameline, and um, in their own words, Frameline's the only non-profit distributor that solely caters to LGBTQ plus film, um, and they were founded in 1981. Um, and so this is the only way that you can you can buy the movie. Uh, it is on Stephen's Vimeo page, but it's a VHS rip uh, with a, a very uh, nostalgic. VHS ad at the start. Um, <laughs> we need more of them. <laughs> yeah, but you know that's that's a fucking shame because this film should be in the Criterion Collection. I don't understand why it's not there. It, mm. it, it it's, it's especially considering some of the films that are in the Criterion co Collection. You know, I yeah. so it th this film going on what you said about the distributors look at this. Do people want punk cinema? I think today this film could really have. A second coming considering the internet considering yeah. festival audiences um it has the production value to 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 pull through you know because there are a lot of experimental films and a lot of lower um lower budget movies that maybe don't have the production value that are still breaking through again um and finding new audiences but th this this uh, this I, I have a feeling that this film it is going to have a you know yeah a i think now we've sort of like you know the rise of the internet and technology 
you know, and all these Gen Z millennials, you can definitely tap into that that audience a, a bit more. Uh, maybe it was sort of like harder in sort of like, you know, the late 90s, early noughties, unless you were sort of like big on, you know, the, the subreddits. <laughs> it was even around then, I don't know. Um, <laughs> but to find your tribe, and obviously we're talking about collaborating and all them things, um, I think there definitely could be sort of like a resurgence of not just, you know, Chocolate Babies, but, you know, other films in a way. It's, it's just about sort of like connecting to the audience. And, you know, even though... We, it's it's quite interesting how a lot of people saying yo it's gonna do bits it's gonna go to this festival it's gonna do that it's gonna do this it's gonna do, it's gonna you know see all these things it's gonna reach the heights um, and then it not do as well as what you know well you know you you would think it, that's just that's just quite interesting but I do maybe play it down to like you know the people who were seeing it was it was it sort of like too much for them and I, I think you know that's probably what it, what it kind of you know came came down to yeah, I, yeah. Stephen referenced this the variety um review by emmanuel levy i want to say or levi um l-e-v-y uh, who, who it's, it's a very lukewarm uh review and in it definitely points out um yeah. some of its good points but it, it kind of sums up the um the the response to it on the on the uh, on the film festival circuit and one interesting thing he says here, Stephen Winter's audacious feature debut, Chocolate Babies, is a colourful but messy satire about a bunch of HIV-positive Asian and black drag queens who decide to take Matt into their own hands, blah, blah, blah. So I think this brings us on to the <laughs> point. And, and it's not, it's yeah. not, you know, um, this was a problem with the popular thinking and cult cultural uh, thinking yeah. of the time. But he, Stephen even said he didn't realise he was making the one of the first trans films you know mm. um they were just drag queens then michael lynch who plays lady marmalade she is a trans actress um but back then she was just lady she was just michael you know um we knew that she had breasts we knew that she was not a guy <laughs> you know um and that character is written as somebody who was in between the genders. Like, it doesn't say on the script trans. It doesn't also say drag queen. Like, none of them are really drag queens. Drag queens is like a, a catch-all way of showing that they're fabulous. Mm -hmm. um, and Michael wasn't a drag queen. Michael was just Michael. Um, and the word trans is never used in the film or any other slang for that kind of stuff. It just what it was. And when Michael came to a screening of the film a couple of years ago in New York, she was like, I'm very proud of the fact that I have this early trans representation, that it's not about being a trans, it's about a trans person who's doing stuff. So um, one of my favorite moments in the film and a, a potentially iconic movie scene, if mm -hmm. it had reached a larger audience, um, spoilers, um, Sam, uh, who is the, the Asian, East Asian American, uh, lead, I guess, who yeah. is interesting because he, st just to digress, uh, I asked him about that and, and what he thought from a screenwriting point of view the structure of the film was. And he said he kind of accidentally wrote uh, an ensemble film. Oh, really? You know, he says <laughs> Sam is the the vehicle who takes us into the movie. Yeah. Um, and we meet Max, who is, the le I think, the leader of the gang. Yeah, leader of the gang. Um, and then we meet all the other characters through that. Um, but Sam and Max are in a relationship mm -hmm. um, and uh, Max is sick with, with uh, HIV um, and Sam goes to see her on this rooftop where we spend a lot of the movie mm -hmm. and there are all these friends around singing. Uh, this song and mm, I am I am yeah which yeah is, which is really good and I sort of related it to that sort of you know uh, relating it to that in a way like home going like that negro spiritual that you see at a lot of sort of like funerals where it's like that uh, ongoing to like the next place and like you know having all these singers in the background talking and well, not even talking, singing. What well, about talking while well, singing? Um, it was it was it was great. Um, it was amazing. I like I loved every part of it. I loved how it was sort of like executed, how it was performed. And also, one thing that I really liked is you know the tears, 
when he gets the sequin. That, I mean, it's brilliant. And he's just it's like, brilliant. you know, that's like, that's why like, I said iconic yeah. because that gangster. Just watching that, it's just yeah. I, I think that for me adds an extra dimension to the movie because it's mm. in, in a lot of films that have a raw energy to them, they they kind of leave you with that feeling, but it it managed to use utilize that energy and. And then just fucking hit you with a yeah. uppercut at the end with this scene. You're just yeah. like, where did that come from? That's what I was saying. Like, it was just, it was quite, it was, it was there. It was, it was up there. You know. Do we there. know who did the music? Um. So, well, according to sort of like you know the credits that we sort of have, it. Uh, I'm hope I'm saying you know, your name right, lovely. Uh, but uh, Mish uh, Braden, um, from uh, Detroit. She's a sort of a theatrical uh, performer and a jazz singer. So linking that back in with sort of like jag performance, theatrics, it definitely was all there. And I think this end scene kind of just tied it all up. Well, not necessarily tied it all up, but because it was a time skip, wasn't it? And then it came to this point. Um, and the whole thing of I am, uh, take what you will with, you know, those those two words. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was it was just kind of great. It was just like it, it's there. And it yeah. Finished, yeah, good point to add uh, the Chicago thing. So Stephen Wins is uh, from Chicago, mm, okay. um, and he was telling me, maybe I can insert a soundbite here. I went to the Arts Institute of Chicago, um, and at the same time, I joined ACT UP Chicago for a few months that summer when I was sort of coming out and being, being a wild young man. And in ACT UP, I don't know how much of the history you know. It started in New York, then it spread. Mm -hmm. um, and it was very much dominated by gay white guys. When I entered Acts Up Chicago, I was immediately settled into uh, the Black Caucus, <laughs> which on one hand was lovely. I got to meet all the, the black gentlemen who were involved in the organization as well as lesbians. But I saw how segregated the situation was. Um, so those black queens did a great job in raising me. Um, and the hypocrisy of where ACT UP was, ACT UP Chicago was in the time, um, was also not lost on me either because they were not intersectional, as we would now call it. Mm -hmm. uh, simultaneously, I was hanging out in the west side of Chicago with black club queens who had a wonderful zine called Thing Magazine. Thing Magazine was about house music and about black people. But the character of the larva... Brunch is served. That is the, a real person. <laughs> His name was Larry. And he was a friend of mine in Chicago, a mentor. And the way that Larva talks in the mag in the m my movie is the same way that Larva talks in real life. That's where the ideas started popping around. And then I um, moved to New York to go to NYU. And this idea just came of black, renegade, drag queen, HIV positive political activists or terrorists who um, were based on an amalgamation of my ACT UP experiences and my Thing Magazine house music experiences and my Korean roommate, <laughs> who uh, now works for Pixar. Wow. And that's where, uh, that's where it all came from. Crazy, yeah. So, <laughs> Chocolate Babies, 1996, go and watch it. It's on Vimeo, um, Criterion Collection. If, if you're listening, yeah, give it a chance. Please do. God burns in heaven, and the devil freezes in hell. And what difference does it make, huh? You know, what difference does it make? You know, maybe, maybe after all is said and done, maybe when all this shit is over, there'll be a little bit of love left for me. And I will know just what to do with it. Get out of my way.